my, my final question, uh, George Washington, many believe, is the first president of the United States. That's true, right? That's a fact. For the so pres- like we first, president, pr- first president of the United States under the U.S. Constitution. There had been men named president before that. They were actually the president of the Congress as opposed to actually How many the pres- were those? Uh, there was like, were four, there's like this, this urban legend that a couple of them were black or something back, uh, back in the day. I don't, okay. do not know of right. any so, single president. All right, I won't uh, get you involved John in that. John Hancock was one of them and okay. uh, John Lawrence, okay. uh, uh, Henry Lawrence, who's uh, the father of the uh, more famous John Lawrence, who's a, a, a figure in the Hamilton play, um, but no, there was, uh, to my knowledge, there was no one. Uh, okay. But so African George American Washington was the first under the current Constitution. Yes, but under he, the U.S. Constitution. But he wasn't unanimously elected. Well, he was unanimously elected, but he wasn't elected by all of the states. So how does that how did that work? Well, it's interesting because there were only uh, there were thirteen states at the time, but two of them had not actually ratified the Constitution. So because of that, they couldn't send electors because they weren't officially in the Union yet. Uh, And then New York State, my beloved home state, um, couldn't decide and and missed the deadline and didn't send any Couldn't decide whether they wanted to ratify the— Well, they couldn't couldn't choose. They couldn't—no, they had ratified the Constitution, but they couldn't decide on who who they were going to— Who was George Washington up against? He was like the general— the guy that went, across, you know. Well, that's the thing. There was really there was no. Who else was s- there? Well, John Adams was on okay. the on the ballot. Each state had uh, had could their put own a, people. They could put up anybody they wanted on on the ballot. The ballots were really left to the state. There were no parties. There's no parties in the Constitution. So George Washington wasn't a Whig, or he just wore a wig. He, he didn't even wear a wig. Okay. No, and, and that's W H I G. W H I G. Right. Yeah. No. He he was eventually what came out of what probably would have been considered Washington's party of the Federalists. Alexander Hamilton and right. John Adams were Federalists, and Washington certainly leaned that way. But Washington didn't like parties. He even warns against it. His, his farewell address to the nation, uh, it's written and published in a newspaper. He says, beware of faction. Look at this. Th- Look at where we are. So do we need to have, how do we get rid of parties? <laughs> I mean, this seems to be a problem. We like parties. It's, no, we yeah, those kind with the with the liquor and the and the you know the and food and some everything. Dancing, some, yeah, yeah. Some nachos and some music. But no, these parties that we have, Republican and Democrat, primarily. How do we get rid of them? Well, I'm not sure we can get rid of them. Uh, I I I don't know even if there's a way to minimize their impact because. Even as as Washington put it, and Madison said the same, and Jefferson, they all talked about how dangerous parties were. They really thought they'd be more organized on regional basis, mm. and they could see, you know, that there would be a slave party and a and an abolitionist party that was coming, and so that was one of the reasons they were afraid of it. But they had this kind of noble idea that the men in Congress, and of course they were all men, and women did not vote then, although women voted in New Jersey in the first presidential election. Really? Yes, they did. My state? Yeah, there you go. Uh, that, they they took care of that pretty soon, though, and made sure they that- said no they, more, no no more, more women voting. No more thing. ladies. Uh, so the men thought that Congress would get together, and they'd They'd be voting on a bill or a piece of legislation, and they would debate it, and they would vote on it. And then the next day, they'd come back, and it would be a different bill, and they'd vote on it and debate it. There wasn't this idea that people would line up and fall into these associations we come we call parties. But it's partly human nature that you want to belong to something. You want to belong to something. You you gravitate towards people who hold your views. Mm. That and also it became practical that the way to really make sure that your bills got passed through the legislature was to make sure that you had a group of people who were always going to be solidly behind that. And of course, along with that, eventually comes the idea that you give favors to the people who who are working with you patronage. So if you were elected and you were in office, you started to be able to dole out the jobs that come with being in charge of the government. So that's a powerful thing that built the parties as we know them. Now, we've gone through periods where parties have 
you know, grown up and died away. The Republicans, of course, did not exist until 1856 as an organized uh, as an organized party. They had uh, been there had been a long process of evolution to get to the point of of the uh, Republicans. But for a long time, it was the Federalists, the first uh, original opposition to what became the Democrats. Later on, the Whigs, uh, and they uh, fell apart. Because the Democratic Party was so powerful for mm. so long, almost anybody who was in government was a of it wanted to be a Democrat because that was the only way to, to get money uh, and to, power. To get money and power. And it was really mm. the, uh, the power, the frightful power of Andrew Jackson in particular, uh, very, very popular president, uh, elected to two terms. Uh, and part of the opposition that grew up to him as a party, and they became the Whigs, was j- just the opposition to him personally, um, because there were former Democrats who became the founders of the Whigs, and they were really, it was the anti-Jackson party mm. at first, and later on that eventually becomes uh, the roots of the Republican Party. Well, I appreciate you. Uh, we're going to continue to educate people because it's so important. And Kenneth C. Davis, he is the author of this book and many others, and they don't know much about history and presidents and a whole don't host of Don't know much about the American presidents. Everything. Uh, you, you've and, written don't know much about a whole bunch of things. Yep. And people can check that out for themselves, but we so much appreciate that you're part of this party of Lincoln. That's our that's our entree into this uh, morass of, of uh, power. We're just trying to get a little bit for our people so that we can, and when I say our people, I mean all people, so that we can exercise this, this great gift that we've been given. Uh, w- without getting on, the, on too much of a soapbox, one of the real points of studying history, I think, is that you understand the tremendous sacrifice that people have made in our history. Many kinds of sacrifice, blood, sweat, and tears, truly blood, sweat, and tears, um, to give us this extraordinary right to have a voice. We are the governed. They only govern with our consent. That's what Thomas Jefferson said in 1776. So this is the this is your chance to to voice your consent or your dissent, and that's too important not to do. Thank you so much, Kenneth C. Davis. We appreciate you. The Party of Lincoln, we're going to continue to do this because it's important.